Good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world today. Thanks for joining our weekly live stream uh, covering all things related to digital transformation. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients through the world with their digital transformation journeys. And I'm excited for our topic today. I'm going to introduce our guest in just a moment. We're here to talk about best practices for or best, best practices and lessons learned for digital transformation project management. And uh, I'll introduce our guest in a moment today, but the intent of today's conversation or the scope of today's conversation, uh, speaking of project management, is to talk about <laughs> program management, project management, all that good stuff, everything mm -hmm. you need to know about project management to make your transformation successful. And actually a lot of what we'll talk about here today is general project management tips and best practices that apply to any sort of uh, internal initiative. We'll try to hone in and focus on the digital transformation angle, but I think a lot of the, the topics we'll cover here today are going to be relevant for any sort of business transformation or any sort of change initiative that you might be a part of. Um, before I introduce our guest, though, if you could please just drop in the chat where you're joining from today. We'd love to hear where you're joining from today. We're, we're watching all the chats and the streams here um, on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So I appreciate you dropping in the chat where you're from, just so we know what city and country you're all from, just to get a sense of our audience here. And uh, while we're at it too, while you're dropping in the chat where you're from, please also drop any uh, questions or comments you have along the way. Um, so we'll get started by asking you uh, where you're from, but we'll also ask you to drop in any comments or, or questions you have for the, my guest and I as we get going here in today's conversation. So again, today's topic is best practices and lessons in digital transformation project management. And joining me from Canada is Adriana Girdler. Uh, Adriana, thanks for being here. Hey, you're very welcome. Thank you. And I see that I have another Canadian on here as well. Yay. <laughs> yeah, at least there's at least two of two of us here from uh, North America. Uh, make yeah. that three now. We've got Michelle from Denver here as well. So yeah, a couple of Canadians, a couple of Americans yeah. and uh, other other countries as Argentina, well. Argentina, India. It's great. Awesome. Yeah. So Adrian, I learned about you or I, I found out who you were, or just got to know you, I guess you could say, through your YouTube channel some of the other social media stuff that you put out there. You put out a ton of content. You have a good following. Yeah. But maybe just tell us a little bit about your your background, sort of what what it is, how you grew up in the project management space, and more specifically, what you do now. I do love that. Grow, I grew up. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, 100%. Um, I'm Adriana Girdler, and I am president and CEO, that's chief efficiency officer of Cornerstone Dynamics, and we're a consulting firm as well. And we are a project management and a process improvement consulting firm. So I've been um, doing what I'm doing, obviously, in my consulting firm for close to 15 years, but this world for other organizations since I graduated. So I've been doing this for a very long time. You're supposed to say you don't look it, but that's okay. Right. You weren't fast <laughs> enough, Eric. And but I'm not quite, joking, I'm not, joking, not. joking. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I have a very, very background. Um, you know, I, I have the background that I have, I'm quite pleased with because I have numerous degrees and things of that nature. But I started out in sales, went back to school for engineering, uh, worked in automotive and pharmaceutical, and um, then started my own consulting firm. And my consulting firm basically works in all different industries because a project is a project, a process is a process, and it's always trying to find the most effective and efficient way practically to get things done because that's what it's about when we're in the business world is how do we get our initiative and strategies and how do we proceed to move them forward in a way that's actually going to deem to be successful. And that's where people fall off the wagon a lot of times is they don't get to what they need to do or it's very difficult to do it. And then there's struggles along the way, which, by the way, doesn't have to be that way. So that's kind of, you know, who I am. I help companies and people do what they do internally better. If I'm going right. to do it in a nutshell. That's a, it's a good way to put it. I love the chief efficiency officer uh, spin on your title too. That's great. I have to have to have a little tongue in cheek. You got to laugh, right? <laughs> yeah. And what I love, what I want to get into too, what I love about your background and your view of project management, just from watching your videos, is it a, the focus on efficiency as you, as you describe in your title, but you also mentioned process improvement and you, you seem to have a pretty complete view of not just the project management discipline, but how it ties into other aspects of a business and strategy and, and all that sort of stuff. And that's some of the stuff that you and I talked about as we were prepping for this, this conversation. Yeah. But maybe to start, um, what, what about um, 
just starting a, starting with the question of what why is project management so important, particularly to a digital or business transformation, any sort of change initiative? Why why is project management so important? We'll start with the basics there. For sure. So let's first define projects because I think that becomes really really important because we don't realize how many projects we actually run, and that's the problem. So a project has a definitive start and end date. That's really really important. It has a deliverable at the end. You usually have a series of tasks associated with it. And most of the time you pull on other subject matter experts to help you execute on that. That's a definition of a project. Now, interestingly enough, if you take that definition, we have a lot of initiatives that we're given that fall under that definition as well. So whether that's a digital transformation initiative, whether that's your boss giving you, hey, we have this new strategy, I need you to implement it. Based on that definition, that's a project. Now, what happens is when we think of projects, we think of these very large initiatives that, of course, you need project management around it. And the answer is yes, of course you do. But what people don't realize is that there's a lot of smaller initiatives, smaller type projects that also need the framework of project management. And that's why project management is so important, because it doesn't matter the industry you're in, what you do, you're always going to have an initiative or a project that has a start and an end, you have to move it forward in order to deliverable, deliver on a goal. And if you want to do that well, then there's a framework and a different hat you have to put on in order to be successful. Right. How did you, just out of curiosity, how did you uh, fall into the realm of project management and, and this focus and dedication to project management? How did how did that come to? Well, come it's, 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 thank you. It's an interesting um, question because when I first started off in my career, I was in sales and I did tons of projects without realizing it. I didn't do them well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, at yeah. all, at all, because I was wondering why isn't this working? Because you're not thinking in the right mindset. So when I went back to school for engineering, engineering is a very, uh, it's just a profession that falls into projects naturally because everything you do is a project. You have to create, you have to develop. And so everything's a project. Um, and as a result of that, uh, I just naturally fell into those roles. I did process engineering. I did a lot of experimentation. When I went into pharmaceutical, that was when I got into the Lean Six Sigma type roles, which again, are all projects. Mm -hmm. um, and I just fell into it. And then I got my PMP and became a professional, uh, a project management professional, um, just to, you know, give credence to the work that I was doing. So I, I fell into it from the chosen profession that I took of mechanical engineering. However, I was doing projects my whole professional career without realizing it in the beginning. So it was only through, um, because I'm also a Lean Six Sigma master black belt um, specialist as well, um, I'm always looking for efficiencies. So with my own projects as I do efficiencies and that's kind of how it all unfolded and I got to where I am today because my own clients and my consulting firm had always asked me, oh my God, you run projects like so well, can you teach our people? And that's kind of what kind of spurred me creating my own online uh, project management course because of that, just the requests that I get. So yeah, that's, right. that's my journey in project management. It is every single person on this uh, live stream does projects whether you realize it or not right and so you yeah. kind of was born out of necessity you didn't necessarily as a kid I think I want to be a project manager. For it. No, no, right it fell it fell on my lap and interestingly enough that's how most project managers become a project manager right. <laughs> is it falls in your lap you actually have a different profession and you kind of fall into it yes can you do schooling for project management listen the best project management um activity out there is experience. And you can do that in any organization and role that you're in, because don't forget, there's initiatives, you can just take principles and foundations, and you can apply them. And then the more and the more you do well with them, they start giving you more and more projects or initiatives, right? Uh, so right. that's how you fall into that role. And digital transformation, by the way, has tons of projects. Yes. Tons. Every single initiative actually is a project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I, I didn't mention this or ask you this in your introduction or your background, but m now might be a good time to t uh, touch on it since you, you reminded me. Tell us about this course that you um, that you have, this online course, and you also have a uh, a promo code that you're offering to our listeners here today. So I want to uh, maybe, maybe you could yeah. just verbalize that and we'll drop it in the chat as well so everyone has sure. a link. Yeah, so um, I have a practical online project management course, which basically I've taken project management, streamlined it, because let's be honest, 80% of projects only need 
some core foundational items. There's tons to project management. And as a project manager, if you're doing large global scale, major projects, yes, you need a whole bunch of other tools that were taught. However, for most people, you don't. So over the years, I've streamlined it. I've used my efficiencies. I've taken the best of the best. And here's what you need to be successful. In fact, this is what I do with my own clients that I get complimented on all the time. So I made Slay Project Management. It's an online course. I believe the chat, you're going to put the link in the chat. And yeah, and for anybody here who's interested, I'm, I have a $50 off coupon for you just because you're here out of my appreciation and gratitude. Yeah, which is an awesome win-win. We get, we get to Absolutely. have you- and you're giving us fifty dollars towards your course. Um, and actually, if you look in the chat, um, check for from either Kyler and or Third Stage Consulting. There's a link uh, to the to the course as well as the promo code in the chat yeah. here for, on whichever platform you're watching. So be sure to check that out. Take uh, off fifty is the coupon code. Take off fifty, and yeah, and that's and your uh, now your YouTube channel is called um, or you, you use that phrase slay project management that's sort of your your tagline it seems to be on yeah your slay slay your project and excel in your career so I have a project a YouTube channel check it out tons of information uh, on projects but not just about how to do things so it's really an educational channel I try to keep things in short snippets because there's a lot of individuals out there who just need some guidance and direction. So that's, and I'm almost at hundred K. So if any of you want to subscribe, I would be so grateful <laughs> trying to get it's over good. that hump. Yeah. I want yeah. that silver plaque, <laughs> right. but yeah, it's, it's all about uh, project management. There is a whole bunch of other career related um, advice in there too, because don't forget projects, are in the professional world. And there's a lot of things in our projects that ex that go outside of the realm of, ex of executing on a task. It's the communication. It's how do we have bring engagement? How do we run efficient meetings? Because all of that is related to project management. So it's really looking holistically at how can you do really well in your professional world and how can you use tools and techniques in order to help you to be really successful and really to make your life easy. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you mentioned this dynamic of your upbringing in your career and how you sort of fell into project management out of necessity yeah. and it wasn't something you necessarily planned to do. And that's something we see a lot with our with our clients too. You know, they're they're being asked to lead these big global transformations, but they haven't necessarily managed a project or been formally trained in project management before. So I wanted to ask this question on behalf of one of our audience members here from Kyler, who's actually our, our podcast co-host. Um, who asked, well said, what are some of the core skills needed to make a project manager successful? So in other words, if I'm, if I get a project handed to me, whether I like it or not, I've been asked to lead this initiative yeah. and I want to lead this initiative. What are some of the, the key skills and some of those core skills that you would recommend that you, you sharpen? Yeah. So I, the first and foremost, and I say this all on my YouTube channel, communication is critical. Um, I think a lot of project leads, managers, individuals don't understand it. I don't care if you say things once, you have to say it over and over. Your communication channel is what makes and breaks a project. There's a whole bunch of other skill sets you need too, but if you don't have really good communication, then that has huge ramifications. So that communication is getting clarity, that communication is getting confirmation of understanding, that communication is providing updates to key stakeholders, that communication is ensuring that you and your project team are constantly in sync so that when risks pop up, you can start addressing them right away. So communication is probably the most fundamental skill set. Now, what's interesting and kind of not even ironic, but just interesting, that's probably a skill set for any profession is communication. And it's sorely lacking. I find people get so busy and wrapped up in what they're doing that they drop communication. But with projects, it's even more so. Why? You have a short window to be successful. I don't have a length of time. I don't have over a period of time where it's okay and, oh, I didn't get to you. No, if I don't get to you, it could have major ramifications on the activities that you're trying to do. So communication is key. Uh, documentation is the second one. You probably hear that all the time. Paper pushers, paper pushers. But I promise you, you do need your paper documentation and you do have to do a good job in ensuring that you capture everything and you document because what happens with short sprints of activities is if things fall through the cracks and you have major things that fall through the cracks, if you don't have proper documentation to show you've done your due diligence, the fingers start pointing at you. Um, and so that's something that becomes really important. But not only that, if people promise you stuff, you need to go back to the documentation. But documentation also provides clarity. What people don't realize is really good documentation. If I hand that off to my team, they should be able to off, go off and run and start doing their tasks without me having to micromanage them. 
So really good. And there's tons of types of documentation that, 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 that you can do. Um, and then really good meeting management, which is really interesting. And again, all of this is transferable to any activity you do. But think about it. In projects, how do we get together with people, particularly virtually? And we have global projects or we have global teams. What do we do? A meeting. A lot of people do not know how to run a meeting let alone run an effective and efficient meeting in order to get answers to move things forward. How many times have you gotten out of a meeting and you have no idea what you're supposed to do? Right. Or you think, or you, think you know what you're supposed to do, but you don't have a due date. Right. <laughs> Even no, worse. No. <laughs> right. So that's why that all comes, it all comes together. Do you need, you know, uh, those are put the top three. Are there more? Absolutely. There's more. Absolutely. There's more. But those are the top three. I would say if you're going to get into a great communication, really good documentation with your organization and really good meeting management. If you understand those, that is going to help you really soar as a project manager. It's fundamental. Obviously, there's other stuff as well. It's not just those three, but those are definitely the three I would call out because they're sorely lacking. I see it all the time. Right. In any role. Yeah. And it, it seems like, um, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is relevant, whether you're um, a consultant or service provider that needs to manage projects on behalf of your clients, or if you're an internal stakeholder at a company that's going through a transformation. But one thing I've noticed, I'd be curious to see what you think of this, is I've noticed that with a lot of our clients, there's a mentality that, you know, the stuff you're talking about, Adriana, is great, but we're going to hire the experts to do the project management. We're going to bring in an outside project manager to manage this initiative for us. And so I kind of get what you're talking about, but I'm, I'm going to defer to the the third party provider. Is this is this a skill set that you would recommend for an internal team, even if you're not a consultant or even if you're not a service provider that's that's helping with it with the transformation? Absolutely. Are you kidding? Absolutely. Because don't forget a lot of <laughs> a lot of times you have a project manager, don't forget, who's looking at the macro view of everything. And there's multiple streams within that project. Okay. Particularly digital transformation. It's not just one person executing the project and a project manager overseeing that person. You probably have software developers, you have your marketers, you have your trainers, you have uh, operations, like you have all these streams with different individuals. Those individuals who are on your project who've been chosen are not the ones who are solely going to execute the tasks. You may have a representative like a manager who's on your project who's going to pass those tasks off to other people. What I just said flows through the hierarchy, flows through from a project manager all the way to the core team members and to the other individuals who may not be on the core team but have to execute on some of those tasks, whether that's an internal person or an external hired individual as well. So there is this flow that needs to have happen and expectations that really need to be set up in a proper way. Sometimes people think of a project manager as a task, tactical taskmaster. That's not the case. It's actually a strategic role. And I think that gets missed. I'm constantly strategizing where we need to go, how we need to do it. Yeah, there's a tactical element to it, but I got my tools and techniques that I put that out. I'm all about strategy. I'm constantly saying to my clients, yes, I know I'm a consultant saying to my clients, but even when I was in the role of an employee to my manager, by the way, what you want here is not going to work. We have to do change control, blah, blah, blah. I was looking at it from strategic. Uh, perspective. I wasn't being told here, you have to do this. I would look at it and understand that bigger picture because I'm in the eye of the storm. Right? Right. <laughs> There's this whirlwind. And I need to tell those particularly outside external steering committee members, senior executives, managers who don't understand it, but I want to scope creep or gold plate items. Like, no, you can't have that. And if you're, you're going to change something, we got to look at scope, time and budget. Let's look at our priority matrix and let's understand how we're going to do that. And there becomes a negotiation that gets associated with it. And that's something that I find a lot of leads and junior people or those who don't have experience or don't have the right tools or techniques start to just think, oh, I have to do this. I'm a taskmaster. I'm a tactical person that just executes what I'm told. The answer is no. No, you're not. You're a strategic individual that needs to ensure from a high level perspective the deliverable of this project or initiative. So how are you going to do that? And sometimes I promise you, those that are not in it daily, don't understand the nuances. It's your job as a project manager to educate people on those nuances so you can get the right decisions done to be successful. Right, right. So that's great. And, and so in addition to this um, fine tuning the understanding or, or fine tuning what it means to be a good project manager, you're, what you're saying is it's a strategic role, not a tactical role. Um, so that's sort of a, a misconception about project management. What, what are some of the other common misconceptions about project management in general? 
Um, anyone can project manage. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a big misconception. It's kind of like, well, I'm a software developer. I guess anyone can create a software. No, there's an education. Oh, I'm a doctor. I guess, I guess anybody can be a doctor. Right. Okay. So, you know, I think what, and like, obviously I'm doing extreme. <laughs> Right, right. Life or death. <laughs> right. I'm doing extreme comparisons to kind of bring about the point. Project management is a distinct skill set. And you really need, as I said, there's a different hat you put on. It's a different perspective. You actually look at it from a strategic managerial role because it's a project manager. So you're guiding a group of people in order to get things done. That not everybody can do that. Not everyone can be a manager. So not everybody can be a project manager. And I think it's like that for a lot of roles. Not any everybody can just be anything. You got to look at the right skill set. Um, and that is, first of all, do they have great organization? Are they able to, you know, herd cats? Like how many times have we been told that? Herding, can they herd? Can they, and how do you convince people? who don't report into you directly, but have a manager who's, and everything they do is tied to their bonuses and stuff like that, if you have that, then start doing what you're asking them to do and for them to be committed to your project when they don't report directly into you. That's a skill set. Right. And I have to say, you know, I get, I have people who don't report into me who are not even, I'm, I'm a consultant. And yet they will jump whenever I say, hey guys, we have to do this, blah, 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 blah. Why? Because I support them and I'm actually giving them what they need in order to be successful and they get it. So they're like, oh my God, yeah, Adriana, you need that because they know it's real. They know it's not fabricated. It's not something I'm pulling out of the air to fill my time. When I look and do everything, it has purpose and I've set it all up and they know from day one what to expect. That really makes an amazing project manager. Right, right. It's, it's great. And so you're kind of covering what the skills required are the competencies required as well as what the misconceptions about those, those skills and competencies are. Absolutely. As well. So here's a getting a little bit more tactical. It's still strategic, but we're getting a little more tactical here on this question from, from uh, Gassan over on LinkedIn. What are some recommendations to minimize scope creep? And maybe you could first well, talk about why, why is that so important to manage scope? And secondly, how do you, absolutely. How do you creep? So why is it so important to manage scope? Because it's so easy for someone who's not part of the project to say, just add that in. Right. Honestly, it's really easy. They have zero clue the ramifications of everything. And as project managers and anyone who runs a project understands it's all about time, scope, and budget. So do I, so with what you're asking me, do I have the resources in order to do it? Do I have the money? Do I have the time? So you have to take a look at all of that because something that seems simple to someone else can actually create havoc to your project. And the other issue along with that is when people ask for stuff, they don't want to give you anything else either. So they want you to do more with less. Okay. There's, there's only X amount of time in the day. Number one, there's only X amount of budget that I probably already set aside so what else do you want me to do? And you want me to add more to my scope? Something has to give. So how do you manage scope creep? So that's what scope creep is, is people wanting more for nothing. <laughs> so, how, so how do you manage it? It's all in the initiation stage. So it's really important. And this comes from the efficiency world. It's all in the design stage, all up front. If you can get things organized up front, you're laughing. So first and foremost, you need a really clear scope statement. And a lot of times I go into projects and there's people don't have clear scope statements. What is it that I'm delivering on? It's not just my two sentence of the summary. It's what's in and what's out. Really critical. And in fact, you know, uh, my course has a scope template. I have all the templates that you need in order to be successful. I have that template set out. The other aspect um, is once you get really clear with what you have to do, you have to connect it with a sponsor and make sure that they're aligned with it. The second thing that you do is a priority matrix. A priority matrix is a tool and technique we use all the time. I use it outside of projects to say, okay, you want this initiative? Let's talk about what do we have to, what's a constraint? What can we optimize? And what do we have acceptance to change? Because a lot of times you go into corporations and everything's a number one priority. So if I have to shift something when I need to shift something, where can I go? So you can only pick one. What's the one constraint? Is it time, scope, or budget? And you do this at the beginning when everyone's really nice and uh, they're polite and you're forming as a team and they're not going to challenge you and they're going to give you the answer and all that stuff. So you do it all up front. So what is your constraint? Is it a budget? Great. Just tell me that I can't change my budget. But then what can I optimize? Is it time or scope? 
it's time. Okay, so what you're telling me is ideally I want you to keep the time deliverable of, let's say, April of 2023. Um, but if you need to change it because it's going to impact on budget, well, then I have some flexibility with that. And then what can I accept? Scope is the one last thing remaining. So now you're telling me I have the ability to shift my scope, take things out in order to ensure I'm on budget and I meet my timeline. So that is how you manage scope creep. Because when someone comes up to me and says, Adrian, I need you to add this in here. I just pull out my priority matrix. Again, my documentation, which is my life, my it's your lifesaver. Pull it out and said, let's talk about it. My budget is a constraint. So how much is this going to cost in order to do? My time is also, I have to opt. So how much time is it going to add? So now I start having a really good solid conversation around scope, time, and budget that these people see um, from a perspective of a document that we're now talking about. I got approval already at the beginning of the project from all the executives and sponsors that they agree that that's the priority matrix and we're all going to abide by it. And that has a huge way. So if someone really, really wants it, then they may say, I'm going to give you more money for it. You don't have that power if you just accept it. You have to go through and filter it through numerous uh, techniques. And the other technique is change control. I have change control forms. I give it to one pager again in my course that I will give to people and say, okay, great. You want that? Can you please fill this out first? And I have to review it with my core team and then we'll raise it up to the steering committee. You'll be amazed. That alone will stop any requests for scope creep because yeah. <laughs> they have to think and they have to think and they actually have to do a little bit of work. And because they have to do a little bit of work, they're like, I really don't need it. Because it's no. so easy just to tap you on the shoulder, say, hey, Eric, do me a favor. This would really help me if you just add this. Not a problem. Fill out the change control and let's talk about how it's going to impact scope, time, and budget. That's really and interesting. I've never thought of that, like how just the fact that you have that control in place isn't just about yeah. the control itself. It's the fact that you're sort of weeding out the, the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the trivial sorts of scope requests or scope change requests. There is tons of trivial requests. And I'm sure with digital transformation projects, you're in the middle of a build and now you're being asked for more requirements. That's not a problem, but you're going to have to put that down the list and you're going to have to add it into your next planning cycle because it is not going to happen now. So it's, it becomes fascinating and it has impact on time and it has impact on budget. And potentially resources, because if you're hiring external people, you may only have them for a set contract. People, this is what a project manager does. These are all these little nuancy details that nobody thinks about. But as a project manager or someone leading an initiative, and this is why your initiatives in the past failed, is you got to think about all this stuff. It's all this, you know, bigger picture and how does everything holistically flow together? Allow your subject matter experts, your core team members to do what they do well, because they are smart. They're there for a reason. Allow them to do their job, have their back and ensure that you can remove all the roadblocks to it. And ultimately is going to end for overall success for the project. Right, right. Now, as far as making decisions on whether or not you increase scope and you, let's just say you get me to fill out a change request, uh, change control form, and um, you're going to, now your job is to figure out as project manager, um, is that something that's acceptable or not? And you've got the parameters, you've got the scope, the, the cost and the uh, timeline, you know, the, the general parameters set for the project. What are some of the other ways you would filter out those potential changes of scope? Is it a business? Are you tying it back to a business case? Or are you? Are there other, you know, ways to tie it back to the overall strategy of the project? Or how, how do you? Take yeah, I, I have in my change control form a series of questions that get asked. So it's not just the request. It's like give me the justification for your request. Tell me what you think is going to be the timing for this request. Link it back to the overall scope statement of the project. Tell me what resources you think are need, going to need to occur in order to have it. Tell me how much budget. And now tell me the pros and cons associated with this request. If it occurs, what is it going to give us? If it doesn't occur, what is it going to give us? Because that's now strategy, right? So that's all in a one pager, very simple. But those are really good questions. People who are asking for requests don't ask. And maybe even don't even have the answer, yet they're asking for this request. Seriously? That's bad business, period. Right. <laughs> that bad business. You don't do that stuff until you have a good understanding. It's a one pager. It's a one page document. It's a powerful one page document to really stop things and nip them in the bud. But if someone fills it out, my God, good for you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm now going to take it my team and we're going to vet it. And I'm going to probably raise it up to the steering committee to say, hey, we have to add this. There's nothing wrong with adding things to projects. Nothing wrong with it. When we do it willy nilly or we don't look at the overall impact it's going to have on scope, time and budget, which again is that Trinity triangle we have in project management, um, then 
then that's what gets us in trouble. But there's nothing wrong with adding something when we start planning it out. Right. That's a great project. Great advice. Yeah. Now, getting back to more of the, the role itself, um, the project management role itself, what are the, and this is from Kyla over on LinkedIn, what are the levels to project management? Sounds like there's multiple roles and levels. And maybe I'll, I'll add to this a little bit or sort of spin it a bit um, into another question, which is more specifically, I always we always hear the term program management or PMO, the program management office, and then you hear the term project manager. Program manager, project manager, maybe help us define those two roles as well as any other sort of sub roles within the realm of project management. What are some of those key things we should yeah, be aware it, of? It can get confusing. So first and foremost, look at I have YouTube videos on this subject, by the way. So go to my YouTube channel. I think I have like a 10 minute video on the different rules within project management, like seriously. So I'm going to cover it here just briefly. Uh, but again, you want to know the difference between a product manager and a project manager, a uh, program manager and a project manager. Again, I literally have it all on my channel. So that is a resource for you. So let's just high level. So there's, it does get confusing. So when you look at it from a hierarchy standpoint, uh, it tends to be, and not all organizations are set up this way. So just because what I'm telling you is a hierarchy kind of layout, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have happen that way. Every company is different. Not all companies are project companies. But if you have a project oriented company, you tend to have multiple layers. Your first layer is kind of like the home PMO, project management office. Right, you usually have a director of project management who is overseeing every single strategic initiative and project that is occurring in the organization. Then the and that's usually a director related level. They usually hang out with senior executives. In the ideal world, they should be of equal equivalence to senior executives so that they can challenge the senior executives and not feel like they have to take on every single project initiative that's asked. They look overall with all our resources that we have in this organization and everything that we want to do. Can I take on this project with all the other projects that we have? So that's that's one. They look at a very high level strategic liberal. The next level underneath that is a program or a por portfolio or program manager. They're kind of you can kind of they're not the same thing, but it depends on how it's set up. So a portfolio um, manager may have a strategic initiative uh, that they have to execute on, and then maybe it has multiple elements to it or multiple programs to it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that has multiple activities and projects and initiatives underneath that. So that portfolio manager is going to oversee a whole bunch of elements in that particular portfolio to sure it's successful. The next layer under that would be the program manager. So under that portfolio, there's a specific, specific program. That program now may have different initiatives that all relate together, right? So, and may have multiple projects that all relate together and that have project managers running those projects. So that program manager is now making sure that they all relate and it's really, it's just taking the role of project manager and scaling it up in a greater context. That's really all it is. So everything you learn as a project manager gets scaled up in a greater context, depending on how you're doing it. So you still need all the tools. You still need all the techniques. You just place them. Uh, you just look at them slightly differently in a greater um, role and probably in a broader role because you have a lot more that you're looking at, not just a project where a project manager oversees one initiative that they've been assigned. Now it's not to say they don't have multiple projects, but they've been assigned and that's what they look after to make sure that it's executed and they could either roll back up to the, the PMO, they may roll up to a you know program manager, they may roll up to a portfolio manager. Again, it's depending on how everything's set up. But if you understand the fundamentals of project management, you can go into any of those roles. It's just that it's a lot more work and it's greater scale. That's all. Right. It's really that, that straightforward yeah. and simple. Yeah, it makes makes total sense. And you were talking about earlier about uh, communication and some of the skills required to be successful. And th this is a really good question or, or maybe a, a comment that I want to get your opinion on, Adriana. And this is from Fernando on LinkedIn. He says, emotional intelligence to be able to manage as a project manager is not easy when the knowledge and experience are mostly technical. So have you found that to be true where you've got a technical initiative like a digital transformation, whether it be an ERP implementation or some sort of systems deployment? Um, Which I've done, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I've done all but, that. <laughs> I've I, done all that. So, okay. So um, 
so here's what I'm going to challenge um, that question with. I'll show you Nothing to, yeah, thank you. So, um, so thank you, Fernando, for, for putting up that question. We put up our own barriers. That's all I'm going to say. And so sometimes we can come with the lens of I'm a technical person and I'm really good with technical. I may not be good with emotional intelligence or vice versa. I'm really good with people skills, but I may not be good with technical. Throw all that stuff out the window. If you're leading an initiative, you're not leading an initiative solely with automation, which means everything's robotic. It's with people. So that's why you got to think differently. Yeah. You know what? Here's a thing now in my career. I'm I'm been doing this for over 25 plus years. Um, I I'm not the expert anymore. Okay, I'm not. Yeah, I have a technical background, so I'm 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 dangerous enough to ask questions, but I still don't know the freaking details, right? I don't, and so I have to rely on on my team. But I do know as a project manager and a lead, it is important that my team syncs. And that's where emotional intelligence comes in. So yeah, you can have, I, I do tons of technical projects. We're constantly implementing you, emotional intelligence because you're dealing with people you need to know. And that's just professionally across the board. I don't care if it's a project. If you have a team, if you are working in a department, you need to understand emotional intelligence. We do not do that enough. We just assume I have a technical background. That's all I need. Nope. Start going on the internet. Harvard Business Review has tons of information on emotional intelligence. There's psychology books that have, I recommend. So I, I had my, my, my first education, I, I have my, my first degrees in history. Interesting. <laughs> oh history yeah, I have a very history, which I loved. Actually, it taught me how to write. Taught mm -hmm. me how to write. Um, I'm telling you, there's nothing that, from an education standpoint, it did what... <laughs> I, I just see everything cyclical, okay? Because everything historically comes back. So that's what that's what I've learned from the degree from a, an education perspective. But the technique, it taught me how to write. It taught me how to think because it wasn't regurgitating history. So um, I really value that because it also, because of that, I also took some other social science courses. Like uh, I took psychology and that was imperative from a human behavior perspective because we are dealing with humans and we're dealing with people and there are behavioral related issues. And the interesting thing is, it's not just about us looking at externally other, our team members and their behaviors. It's us looking at ourselves as well. So if you're gonna lead anybody in any role, you need to have a good foundational understanding of who you are. You need to have a good foundational understanding of what you represent, what are your values so that you can live them constantly. And then you need to have an understanding of emotional intelligence and how you can pick up on things with individuals so that you can be successful. Because I promise you, there are times I'm in meetings and someone did not get what they were supposed to get done. Now I have a couple of things. I could react, okay? I could react and yell and be upset. Well, that's, what is that gonna get me? Zero. Right. Anything is gonna get me them being pissed off and upset and humiliated mm -hmm. that they got called out in a meeting. So if anything, I pick up on the cues. This is why in virtual meetings, particularly if you do a lot of virtual, I always ask people to put on their camera. I cannot get those cues from a voice. I need to get it through a facial expression. So a lot of times I see in the facial expression and give the benefit of the doubt of the person. This person always delivers and they haven't delivered this time. Whoa, I wonder what's going on in their life that something occurred. So I'll reach out to them afterwards. I'll go, okay, you know what, Jane, thank you so much um, for letting me know that you didn't get that done. Why don't we uh, you know, um, connect offline and just talk about this further and we'll move on to the next agenda item. And then we'll kind of figure things out that way. That's emotional intelligence is to pick up and understand and see the nuances that are occurring that are in cues that are not verbal. So that becomes really important and to pick up on that and understand that greater picture. If you're, that's a huge skill set that will take you in your life professionally, personally as well, because it's all about relationships. It's all about people. Right. Now, on the flip side of that, um, sort of shifting gears from the emotional intelligence piece and some of the, the intangible aspects or the, the soft side of project management, what about the other side of this? And you were sort of alluding to the fact that you're not an expert in any one technology or technology in general, but you're, you're, you could still be a very effective project manager. 100%. Um, 
But this question from Alex over on LinkedIn is, as a project manager, can you abstract away the tech or is it beneficial to understand the tech or the domain you're working in? So yeah, the answer is yes to both. You can do both, all right? It's who you are as a person. I am a knowledge seeker. I love knowledge um, and I like to understand what I'm dealing with. I don't need to know the nuances and the full details. I like to understand what I'm dealing with. So I do a lot of tech projects. I do a lot of tech projects uh, with a lot of software development. I am not a software engineer, okay? Sometimes those things go way over my head, but I'm really good at what I do and I'm not afraid to say, I don't know and can you educate me? So a lot of times in meetings, I let people know, look, at my expertise is to give you this big picture, is to manage everything, to make sure we're on track. That's why I do a lot of the documentation, the organization. Again, there's templates. I'm going to throw you back to my course because it's good for project management, any initiative. Um, I know, shameless plug, but I'm letting you know, it's, it's like, this is, this is what I do. So as long as I get all that organized, I then start working with individuals to understand a little bit better. Because if I have to develop my action plan, my, my, my WBS action plan, I need to have an understanding of how things work. So I will spend time with people. And a lot of times people throw out acronyms and stuff like that. And I'll go, you know what, guys, you'll have to forgive me. As your project manager, I just need to have an understanding of what you guys are talking about. Can someone explain that to me, please? And they will. And then all of a sudden, I get to know more. And you start to pull out all these little nuggets. And again, I don't need to have all the answers. I just need to know enough to be able to challenge. That's all. And saying, okay, and put and connect the dots, because that's my job is to connect the dots, right? And to help my team and to help them think a little bit differently too, because sometimes technically, um, technical individuals, again, I'm being very, I'm broad stroking here. Not everybody's uh, made of the same paintbrush, can have tunnel vision and can say, it has to happen like this. And so my job is to say, okay, look, at we have a time constraint. We now have to do kind of things in parallel. We have to be a little more agile. Um, and I'm not talking about just agile and methodology because that's another thing as well. But we just have to be a little more agile in our approach. And I'm going to help you remove those roadblocks. And let's maybe think of a couple of things, not have tunnel vision, but let's see how we can take it out and share that bigger picture. That becomes really uh, powerful. Yeah, and it, it seems like as, as you're talking and as you know, I'm sort of unpacking everything you're saying here, it seems like as a good project manager, you really have to have a, a pretty broad understanding of multiple things. I mean, not just technology, not just emotional intelligence, but also uh, process improvement and change management and data migration, integration. You think of all these different things that happen in a big initiative and you, you can't know it all, you right? To your point, you can't in each of these areas, but you kind of have to know how that all ties together. The technical pieces, the process pieces, the people, human sides of things. And how, how do you manage that? I mean, that's, that's a lot so for a project manager. It, to it is. Uh, and you don't have to know it all on day one. Okay. Like, what do we learn for softer skills? It is okay to say to someone, I'm learning. I don't have all the answers. I need your help. If anything, that actually connects people more to you. Because they go, because now right. you've just put some responsibility on them. <laughs> you didn't have right. the assumption. Right. So over the years, so over the years, I've done so many different types of projects. So now I... Look, at, as I said, over 25 plus years, I have a shitload of experience. I'm so sorry if I swore. I shouldn't have swore. Um, I have tons of experience. <laughs> tons. You're not the first. So um, <laughs> the experience builds, right? But even when I go into a project, I'm still to this day given new initiatives. I have zero clue. So how do I handle that? Well, I have obviously experience and wisdom from over the 25 plus years. But this is where project management now comes into play. When I'm given a project, I don't kick it off immediately. I spend four to six weeks hanging out with my sponsor, hanging out with my clients, speaking to subject matter experts who are probably going to be on the project anyway, collecting my data that I need to fill out my project charter which talks about the justification of the project, which talks about the layouts, the expectations, the scope statement, what's in, what's out, budget constraints, timeline. So I actually do a lot of preparation work, which educates me, educates me. And the sponsor, there are people out there who know, and sometimes not, maybe not everybody knows full start to end, but it's my job to pull it out and piece it together. So I have this package now. And I get it approved by senior executives and steering committee. I'm going to learn this over the years. Do not move forward on a project without getting all your ducks lined up in a row, at least benchmarked. It's obviously going to move as time progresses. You get that approved. Then you have your kickoff with your team. 
And that kickoff for me is minimum half a day. Um, and I would go through the charter, we answer questions, we'll create our project plan. Why? Because we have all the information. And then literally the next day they can start working. It is powerful, it is huge. That's how I run my projects. I tell people who now hire me, and even when I worked in organizations, that's how I did it. I would always push back on the executives. Do you want this done well or do you want it like do you want it fast or do you want or do you want it done well? If you want it fast and you're pushing me to get it done, I promise you I'm going to come across tons of issues because you're not giving me the time to plan and prepare to set this up correctly. And now with clients, I go, look at I have a way of working. If you want to hire me, you got to follow my way of working. Are you okay with that? And if they can't, I'm saying, well, then that's okay. Find a different project manager. But I'm letting you know that this is how I work. And it, it it's it's if you can take that away and prep, it's like think of it painting a room. You want to change the color, but you moved into a house, you bought a house. Oh my God, congratulations. Smoker used to live there. Damn it. Stinks. There's stuff on the wall. Are you just going to take a coat of paint and paint immediately? No. Why? Because it's not going to last. You're, you're going to, it's going to seep through. You're going to have issues. Okay. It's the same thing with projects. What do you do? Well, you move everything out. You wash the walls, you prep it, you prime it, then you paint. Paint is easy. Executing your project is the easy part. It's all the prepping and organization that you, if you do properly and well, and you do it up front, executing a project is easy. In fact, that's where all my hard work is. That's why I'm always like, oh, I can't wait for the project to get into a groove because man, it just runs on its own. It really does when you do it well. Yeah. Well, what's funny about what you're saying is that it seems as though what, what you described as far as taking those four to six weeks or however long up front to prep, that may seem like you're slowing down. We're not making progress. But it seems like, in my mind, that's the faster way. If you if speed is important to you, then that doing it the way you describe it doesn't feel like it in those four weeks. Maybe you might feel like, well, we're not hitting any milestones yet, or we're not we're not seeing any progress in terms of building a new process or building a new technology or whatever the deliverable is. But you are setting up to where it can run more smoothly, and you run into a lot less issues to where you're probably going to finish it faster and cheaper than if you wouldn't have done that prep stuff up front. 100, 100%. And the problem that people do is, oh my God, I got this initiative. I'm going to kick it off. Team, come in here. This is what we have to do. And they all have questions, but you have zero answers. Zero answers. Okay, I'm going to get you your answers. And then four to six weeks go by because you still have to use that four to six weeks to get all those answers, right? That's what people don't realize. And then what happens? You lost the momentum. They're busy on other projects right? They are now like, well, look at, I don't have time for this anymore. And now you've just created more work for yourself because you now need to get new people. You got to bring them up to speed in the whole nine yards. So it's like, look at, you have to plan anyway. So you right. might as well plan before your kickoff and get all your information and connect with the right people. Cause I promise you this, when I'm given my initiative from a client executive, uh, even when I worked in uh, the organizations, they only had a partial picture. And their timelines were never realistic, by the way, ever, 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 ever. So when I did my my prep work to get my charter, and I, there are a lot of times, and that's why as soon as I was done my charter, I would get senior executive approval on it because the time changed from what they thought it would be. The people changed from what they thought it would be. The scope I got locked down, and there's now some really clear ins and outs. And some of those assumptions that they had, they thought was going to be in the project, is actually out of the project. That's really important too. Uh, we talked a little bit about risk and assumptions and we get clarity on roles and responsibilities and it is critical. That's just going to help you. And obviously the priority matrix, what's constraint, what can I optimize and what can I accept? That's all part of that charter. And so that becomes a really critical document that now before I kick it off and get my team going literally the next day, how cool is that? I just got you excited. Oh my God, we're here in this project, guys. I am so thrilled. I'm your project manager. We have ways of working. We have a charter. And as of tomorrow, we're going to start going. How does that sound? Oh my God, that sounds great. People want to do a good job, right? They don't have to wait six weeks and I don't have to reinvigorate everyone. And then probably have some people who don't have the time because they were given something else because they have free time, right? They don't. They just were waiting for you to get your stuff you know, organized. That's all. Yeah. It's well, really it simple. Like <laughs> I know. So why, why, why doesn't everyone do this? <laughs> I know. Because you know what? People aren't taught. Mm. People don't know. They're not taught. This is not taught in school. Um, and the templates and the way to do it, again, there's a streamline and a way to think of it. You're not taught this. 
And we don't, and we think of project management only for big initiatives. But what people don't realize is project management is for all initiatives. Therefore, you can take look at in my course. You, if you, you can do it all, if you have a really important project, or you can cherry pick and take a few things out. Because I promise you, there's a lot of things in project management tools and techniques you can take and place to other things. Like I promise you, strategic planning. Everybody better be doing a risk register on strategic planning, right? They don't. Right. You know, and that's that's a project management 101 tool. Well, in a secondary benefit of everything you're just describing, this whole thread we're on right now, is that if you do that planning up front, you've got the charter, you've got the change control process, you've got team roles and responsibilities clearly identified, you've got that linkage back to the strategy, all that stuff up front. Yeah. By doing that, not only is the project running more smoothly just because you've got the processes laid out and your internal resources can can do a good job to use your words. But also when you bring in third parties, when you bring in the consultants, the technical implementers, all that, now you've got a framework to manage them and hold them accountable rather than letting them run amok with the project. Which They is are, they're part of my team. And I think we forget this. So I may, I, I come in to a project and, and one of the things my clients always say is, Adriana, you know more about our company than we do. <laughs> <laughs> Because I really get involved. In fact, I start talking of we. Okay, we, we have to do this. Like I, I become part of that company. And as an, I'm not an employee, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So I have employees, internal people on projects, and I have external people on projects that they've had to hire out. They all are part of my project team. We all come together. I don't separate them. And I think that's another misconception that happens as well, is that we'll separate them. Now, if someone is programming, I need to have them in my meeting or I need to at least have a core person who can talk to them and make sure that they have the same sort of project management techniques to oversee that. If not, bring that person in, because I promise you, I don't know how many times with initiatives, both hardware and software, and particularly when they combine the two together, um, you need to start talking to those key people because there is going to be programming changes. And we may want it because of a hardware related issue. And if we need to change that, I can't make assumptions. You really need to talk to the person who's creating the code associated for it, because I promise you, they're going to come across things that we just don't know. And then don't forget your UX designers as well. You just can't change that stuff on them as well. So right. you got to bring everybody. You have to bring in the core people who can represent. And you don't have to have a team of 50. You know, my core teams tend to range from 8 to 10, depending on the scale. My smallest one actually right now is 5, which is pretty small. Um, but you know, they have other teams, sub teams underneath them. And so we just set up the expectations and I will sometimes hop on those sub team meetings. Ultimately, you know, everyone understands and I've laid it out like, Hey, this is, you know, this is how we work. We're a little working holistically. You're going to go into, you know, Joe, you're going to report into Joe for everything, but you know, I may reach out to you for stuff as well. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, um, Time's flying by, speaking of project management. And it, being that you're a project management guest, I can't, uh, I don't want to run over time here. And, time uh, still budget, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but just to maybe sort of bring this all full circle here, um, you know, just sort of put a put a, a fine pin in it. Um, what are some of the ways that, you know, if, if, if I'm a project manager, I'm part of a team or I'm an aspiring project manager, or I've been handed responsibilities, what are some ways to get started, you know, in, in terms of establishing some of these best practices and capabilities that you're talking about here today? What are some tips or takeaways that we could okay. take with them to get started? Yeah. I, shameless plug, take yep. my course. No, like seriously. Um, I'm so many compliments on it. And it's only because this is like the stuff I do, right? So I'm, I'm sharing with you my success. Take the course. It's just going to help you professionally in, in, in business. So that's number one. And the reason why I say that is because it in the course, it actually tells you what to do. It frames it out. It's a framework for project management. It's it's not a software, which is a tool. It's a framework to share with you project management. So take the course. It gives you all the templates. It teaches you everything. And then when you do get something, don't just run off and start doing it. You need to start planning. You need to talk to the person who gave you that project, which is usually a sponsor, and you need to get some information from them and start locking down the assumptions. And the best way to do it is through specific templates, which again, I have for you. It's all set up. So you lock all that down and then you create your charter and then you do the kickoff. And then again, there's a roadmap that I have that, that shares with you the whole process. But again, it depends on what you are trying to achieve and the scope and how 
at how large that initiative is. Cause you don't have to do everything that's in my course. You can cherry pick and do a few things, but it really, you know, has, um, impact and, and it will guide you on. That's all I do. There's a freaking checklist. I just pull it, print it out and I go, okay, you're done that. Check, 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 check. It's, it's really, you do not. And this is the efficiency part of me. And this is my master black belt coming out. If you're scrambling all the time and you're stressed, your processes are broken. Mm. So don't scramble plan. You know, you need to, and again, the checklist is, you know, every project goes through this. I may take something out or I may even add something in, but there's, it's the framework is still the same. The framework has not changed. And so, you know, use those tools and techniques and templates that are already created to, to help you be successful. The spin you're going to put on it is your personality. The spin you're going to put on it is who you are as an individual and how much emotional intelligence you have. And, you know, the other softer skills like your communication, your meeting management, like that all, you know, can really make or break projects as well. I have tons of meetings, but, you know, um, I make them fun because um, I laugh a lot. But I like I'll, I'll do things for inspiration, but I but I don't do the cheesy stuff. Right. Because not everybody likes that cheesy stuff. And in all honesty, we got a lot to do. We don't have time to do cheesy stuff. <laughs> Right. But we can still have fun while we're working really hard because we have a short timeline to get this deliverable uh, out the door. So that that becomes uh, really important. But anyway, and there's lots on my YouTube channel uh, too. That is a free free resource, free free information for everybody. I highly recommend. So yeah. So if you're if you go to YouTube, search for Adriana Girdler, G I R D L E R. Yeah. Um, and I'm getting a couple of questions here in the chat on, on multiple streams again for how, how can they find the course? How can we find that course? Uh, we put the link yeah. in the chat if we forget. The link's or, in the chat. But if, if here, adrianagirdler.com will take you directly to that. So A-D-R-I-A-N-A-G-I-R-D-L-E-R.com actually will take you to the course. It's on the platform Thinkific. So it will change the, the URL will change once you go on the, the platform itself. It's up there on the link. Um, and yeah, get $50 off the, the course, uh, the coupon itself for the course. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come back if you ever want to do a part two yeah. follow up. So yeah, maybe like a you're getting a, a, yeah, like a project kind controls of a, or something. Ab absolutely. There's some cool things that we can really get into. Oh my goodness, the stuff we can get into. That's why I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> I know your, your YouTube channel is very good, by the way. I think I mentioned at the beginning, that's how I found you or knew of you and actually started using your channel and your videos as a way just, you know, you want to be inspired by other people and you do some things really well that I don't. And so I look to your channel as like the energy level, just your personality, the way it comes through in the videos. And it's just, they're very good videos. I mean, they're very content, very solid content wise. So I think it, it is a very good channel. So I do highly recommend it. And who knows, maybe get over 100K. It kind of popped up on mine. Say that again. Oops. There we go. I was having connections. Was that me or is that? I don't know. I don't know. I it might changes. have been both of us, but I hear you now. At least it okay, didn't happen. I hear you end. now too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank God, right? <laughs> I know. Right. You could have, you could have I appreciate that. I appreciate it. hundred percent. Uh, yeah, no, this was a lot of fun. Eric, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great, great questions and really engaged audience. You have an awesome audience here. You're very blessed. So congratulations on that because I'm sure, you know, that that's a journey in itself, really going out there with the social media. I understand, you know, it takes energy and effort. So I hope everyone appreciates what Eric is doing here uh, to give you amazing resources. Absolutely. And, and thank you for being here. And thanks for the, the promo um, for our for our audience here to, to be able to um, to be able to join um, the the training course. And again, it's take off 50. So take OFF50 is the promo code you can use when you go to buy it, you get $50 off. So um, be sure to check that out. And um, thank you again for being here. Really appreciate it, Adri Adriana. And uh, I will definitely want to have you back on. So hopefully we can have you back on here in a, in a, a few months. And uh, revisit some of these topics in more detail. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much again for inviting right. me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thanks to the audience for the great questions. And again, uh, you can find this live stream every Tuesday on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. This uh, this actual recording is going to become part of the Transformation Ground Control podcast episode that comes out a week from tomorrow. So be sure to subscribe to my podcast uh, called Transformation Ground Control on any audio podcast platform as well as on my YouTube channel as well. So I uh, hope you all have a great day and a great week, and we will see you all next time. Take care, and thanks again, Adriana, for being here today. Thank you.